In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, <coughs> God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant that by the same Spirit may be truly wise and ever joyous in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Lady Fatima. Pray for, Pray for us. St. Joseph. Pray for us. Pray for us. Terry. Pray for us. St. Natius. Pray for us. St. Mary Magdalene. Pray for us. All God's angels and saints. Pray for us. In the name of the Holy Spirit. So we welcome you to the Ignatian Forum with uh, Eric Files and Mary Matran, and Father Ed Broom, and we're going to have a really good conversation today as we start to talk about the saints. Today we celebrate St. Mary Magdalene. What a saint. When I was a little kid, I thought that the saints were born perfect. That they were living in just in another milieu different than us. I thought they didn't have to go to the bathroom. I mean, just uh, that was one of my misconceptions of a saint. But then in time, I recognized the saints are sinners. They're sinners that are resilient. Kind of like a Super Bowl. Maybe you played with that when you were in sixth grade. You could bounce that Super Bowl over your house. I remember doing that. No, there were the smaller ones and the bigger ones. No? The, we tend to be more like Plato, kind of plop, onomatopoeia, kind of plop. <laughs> they uh, they bounce back quickly. The new Chepi. But today's Mary Magdalene. I think a saint that speaks a lot to the modern world. Well, Eric, um, as always, I'd like to uh, <laughs> ask you a question, and I think you're ready to field it. Um, Mary Magdalene. There's the pre-conversion and post-conversion in her, right? Kind of like you divide her life into like uh, B.C. and A.D., no? Like a Saul and then St. Paul yeah. and Augustine before, before 31 and Augustine afterward. What can we learn, Eric, about saint, and they say saint, Mary Magdalene, can we learn anything from her life that we encounter in the Gospels, right? So much we can learn from her, cannot cover it in an hour. She's, I think she's a super saint, super saint. She is one of my favorites um, <clears throat> because there's such an inspiration about her story. Um, and <clears throat> the, um, just the deep love and fervor, even to the point where even, I think maybe the apostles sometimes thought she was maybe a little neurotic at times because she was so... Word, if they knew that word, they might have used it. Yeah. <laughs> right, Father? They didn't really believe her when she came to tell them, you know, about the that she had seen him. Mm -hmm. And just like, uh, sometimes maybe we know certain people in our lives that tend to be... Um, you know, very uh, animated or maybe dramatic about things, but we never know. There's, there could be a saint lurking there that we don't recognize. Like, But she also, as you said, Father, you had kind of characterized a number of saints that had sinful paths. And the scripture tells us that Jesus exercised seven demons from her. But I just love her because um, she's such an inspiration to me and for that phrase, nunc chepi. Um, now, um, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, uh, there was a book written about her visions of uh, Mary Magdalene, which is one of my favorites. 
And they did say that she, she had a, an initial conversion and then she fell and then she came back again. So she had like a reversion. And we read in the lives of many saints that there are different levels of conversion in their lives. But um, I can relate to that. That, that happened to me also. So, uh, but then to where she finished her life uh, so strong, um, being completely devoted to Jesus. And I think uh, tradition has it that it was in a cave venerating the cross. So just so many things to say about her, but uh, I will say that one of my favorite rosaries, this little plastic rosary is over probably 10 years old. And um, her relic was out in Southern California. I think it was a hip bone. It's a large relic. And I touch this to the case on her relic. Oh, wow. So I keep this wow. with me almost all the time. I think you can say, Mary, is that when you contemplate the life of Mary Magdalene, there's always hope. You know, there's always hope. Because this woman seven devils and lives a pretty promiscuous life for we don't know how many years, but a, a, a really sinful life. Do you think that gives hope to maybe hardened sinners that really feel there's no hope for them, Mary? What do you think? I think she's a great example for them, and we give them a lot of hope. Like Eric said, even her reversion, it wasn't just a conversion, it was a reversion. And, uh, you know, there's a saying, uh, the greater the sinner, the greater the love when they return to Christ. And she certainly had passionate love for him, passionate in the sense of, a good sense of, a, a total self-giving love. And uh, I think that great sinners can become great saints. And she's an example. Yeah. I was reading up on her, um, what I do before I give my talk in the morning, I try to read up on the saints. And um, one of the other elements, after her conversion, she would follow Christ. So there's a certain number of uh, pious women with... Um, economic resources they would uh, supply for the Lord. And I spent a lot of, I spent more time than usual thinking about that. Um, and I, I see it this way. You, Mary, and you, Eric, very often you help me uh, in many, many ways. For example, you're an email, a phone call, uh, maybe making photocopies or maybe doing some type of um, financial um, uh, thing. And it's very helpful because if you can do that, then I can spend more time confessing and preaching and teaching. In a certain sense, I see that that's what she was doing. She was behind the scene with other Mary Solomon, a group of them, they would probably, I see it this way, they would see our Lord is preaching with the apostles. I mean, they've been preaching the whole day. Uh, by the way, here's a meal we have for you. Or, And I notice uh, uh, St. James, you know, his sandal is falling apart. <laughs> we were able to, here's a pair of sandals, you know. Notice uh, um, St. Peter, you know, your, your shirt is ripped. <laughs> it's getting cold. Here's another shirt. I can see them providing for those, because they said that they would minister to their needs so that they wouldn't have to worry about these material things. So I, it's a little detail I think that's underestimated. Otherwise they would, you know, they would have to worry about where's their next meal going to come and maybe they have to go to the town store to get some sandals and they wouldn't be able to preach the word of God maybe to an extra 500 people. So one of the roles of the lay people is to help the priest in his ministry so he can be more available to preaching and praying and administering the sacraments. I agree. Would either of you like to comment on that? Um, 
I think it's important, Eric. Uh, I never really thought about it so much as today because if we don't have people, good people like yourself to help us out, you know, I could be spending half of my life, you know, basically going to the store and you know buying, <laughs> buying my shoes or this and that. We even have a you know a barber that comes here to cut our hair, so we wouldn't have to wait online for two hours to get our hair cut. No, these things help us mm -hmm. to make us. And I think it, in a certain sense that the priest is going to become more and more like a, I think a precious commodity. Be, you know, they're they're less and less around, and it's uh, so I think the lay people should facilitate our work so we can carry out our specific mission. Would you agree with that? I agree, Eric. Absolutely. The the uh, I guess you could almost think of it as a support ministry. Uh, and to really keep you in the confessional in the pulpit. <laughs> so uh, that, and I, I think that's part of God's plan. And I believe also that God puts that into, um, you know, his, you know, it should be in the plan of life for, you know, many people. And even, you know, just about anybody in the parish can help in some way or another. Like you said, Father, whether, whether it's financial, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, or, you know, like people that help out here, helping with Father Larry and Father uh, Father Antolini. Uh, they understand there's, you know, we've got, you know, all these priests here in this rectory, and we want to be able to allow them to do, be more directly to work with the charisms that God gave them and the power that God gave them through their ordination. That's very powerful, and so it makes sense. Um, and going back to St. Mary Magdalene, um, in the book uh, from Anne Catherine Emmerich, it says that her and Martha and Lazarus had, had some means, and that she was able to use that to, to help out, um, you know, in supporting uh, Jesus and the apostles while they were doing, doing their work. Um, so... It's the call of the king, and the king was with them. Beautiful. Yeah. So it goes on to say that those people who do have means, economic means, they still can become saints if they know how to utilize their economic means and know how to channel it in the proper way. And you have people that are very wealthy and they can be very holy. But, you know, people can be very wealthy, but very attached to their riches. No? The Gospel this Sunday is the pearl of infinite price. You know, the infinite price is Christ. You got Christ, you got everything. You got the Eucharist, you got everything. Right? So, um, Mary, any, any comments on this topic? Just to build on what you just said, if we have Persona Christi, if we have the priest, we have everything. Yeah. You are Christ present to us, and you bring us Christ in the sacraments. So anything that lay people can do to support the, to, to the mechanics of the work, so you can do the actual preaching and teaching and sacraments and praying, your own prayer life. Um, I, I think anyone at St. Peter Chanel, I, I don't know how other parishes are formed, but anyone here would gladly do anything to support the work of the priests, and many jump in and help in many, many ways. But you are Persona Christi, you are Christ to us, and, and you're the gift that God has given us, and we're very grateful. Thank you. When I was on the radio the other day with Chuck Neff on um, Relevant Radio, in her life we were talking about confession, and I told him that uh, despite the pandemic, we really try to be available, and the fact that I said that uh, we're available for confession 11 to 1, and then from 5 to 7, we have the past five, six weeks, five hours, four hours a day. Uh, I almost felt as if he fell off his chair. He said that he never heard anything like that before. That's right. And if it were not for the servers, the chairs, the awnings, all those things are, are uh, seem to be peripheral somewhat tangential, but if you don't have the peripheral in which it's set up, 
Um, I even notice when people are coming in, they're they're sometimes uh, disoriented because it's a uh, it's a total novelty. They don't know where to go, you know. And the servants will say, "Okay, here, here's the six feet distance. This is your place." And after this person finishes, then you go. And here's an examination of conscience. And it's um, I think a well-ordered machine. If they really think that a well-ordered machine, and thanks be to God that we're able to facilitate so many people coming from all over the place because of uh, the well-ordered machine. It's called infrastructure. In business, it's called infrastructure. infrastructure. And, that, and that allows the business to, to uh, perform well, uh, excellently, and, and, and blossom and prosper. And, and we have a good infrastructure here at St. Peter Chanel that allows the priests to do their work. Yes. Eric, um, another detail in the life of Mary Magdalene, and this is not so much biblical, but it's um, the movie of Mel Gibson, Passion of the Christ. Obviously, the, the principal protagonist of that movie is Christ. But the Blessed Mother has a very prominent role, too. But if you notice, once, once um, they arrive at the, the scourging and the kind of cross, Mary's present, but Mary Magdalene is very close to the Blessed Mother. Almost every step, she's side by side with the Blessed Mother. And um, one of the scenes that touched me most is the scourging at the pillar. You remember when our Lord was scourged, there in the background, watching it all in the movie of Mel Gibson was the Blessed Mother and Mary Magdalene. Went on for about eight, eight minutes. Then after the Lord was released, they, um, Claudia, who was the uh, wife of Pontius Pilate, was aware that Mary and Mary Magdalene were actually watching that. And there's basically pools of blood. They say pools of blood. Claudia very gently gave the, clouds, the, the, the towels to Mary and Mary Magdalene. And they both got down on their knees and they started to wipe the precious blood. That was a really touching scene. You see them on their knees and they're, they're trying to wipe up every drop of his precious blood. But Mary Magdalene was there also working hard side by side with the Blessed Mother. Do you remember that scene? Absolutely. Does that scene say anything to, uh, to you, Eric? I think it's, we could do a whole hour meditation just on that, if not more. <laughs> we could, and we talked about this yesterday as well. But I think that also talks about the great love that Mary, um, our Blessed Mother, and Mary Magdalene both had for Jesus. And what an act of love and reverence that is, and even imagining um, if that if we had personally watched that happening to our own child, even at a natural level, but even at a supernatural level, the value of his blood. Um, this is the month of his precious blood. And so it would be a good one to do this month for a holy hour. But the other thing that strikes me about that is you talked about both of them being at his side and being close when he was going through his passion. And most of the other apostles, with the exception of St. John, were nowhere to be found because it was risky. And you, th you think about the, um, the two standards and the call of the king and how that was in play. And even all these people who had... a ostensibly been helped by Jesus, these thousands and thousands of people that he cured and that he exercised and that he had helped during his three-year public ministry. Where were they? There were just those few that were at the foot of the cross, and they were willing to risk their lives. I mean, they were risking their lives, even by doing that act of they were showing whose side they were on. They were responding and it was very clear where their allegiance was. And um, that was something that when they're putting Jesus to death for one of his followers or even to be his mother, 
um, could be very dangerous because they could be looked at as as a threat by the people that were putting him to death. That's the way I look at it. And so, to me, it was a great proof of their love and then the deep reverence that they had for him by, you know, so uh, carefully collecting his blood with, with those clean cloths. Yeah. The homily this morning I made, um, the thrust of my homily was that during uh, our difficult times, it's important that we be close to our friends in the thick and thin of it. And the fact that Mary Magdalene was there when our Lord was carrying the cross, and John was there when he was carrying the cross, and the Blessed Mother was there when he was carrying the cross, maybe they were not able to exchange so much words, but the mere presence of someone in these critical moments, I think, are very important. A practical example would be, um, last night we went to um, a wake for John Davies' wife, uh, Raquel, and uh, not that we really said that much, um, but the fact we offered our condolences to uh, John and his daughter, Mary Ann, and her husband, Mario, and said we're going to be praying for them, praying for her. I feel that that meant a lot. And I feel that that's somewhat parallel to what I'm saying now is that Mary, Mary Magdalene, John the Evangelist were with Jesus in those difficult times. As Eric, Man, Eric just uh, mentioned right now, all the other apostles, they took off because you know that could have meant their lives. Uh, maybe they're thinking, well, if this is going to happen to Jesus, uh, we're not ready to be crucified. <laughs> Better to find, um, seek refuge now. But um, I think also in our spiritual life, we want to we want to sit down to the wedding feast of Canaan and taste that wine, but we want to be there in Calvary too. Share in the Lord's joys, but also share in His His sufferings and His cross. What do you think, Mary? Is there any wisdom in that? Yes, a lot of wisdom. Um, I heard a phrase that I think you'll like. You, you talked in your homily this morning about a fair-weather friend. Yes. If someone's around when, when the party's on, but then when the crucifixion comes, they're not around anymore. Mm -hmm. But um, this person, I'm, I want to say it was Adrian Rogers, but I'm not sure. And he said, are you a fair-weather friend or an all-weather friend? an all-weather friend. You're there in good times and bad times. And um, I think that the witness of St. John and Mary Magdalene being there with Mary, Mary would be there. Can you imagine if she'd been there by herself? Can you imagine that? But John was there, all right? And that's why he's the one that Jesus said, you know, this is your mother, this is your son. Uh, and Mary Magdalene was there. So... Um, the, that um, closeness to Christ on the cross and to our Blessed Mother on the cross, um, we can still do that today. My, where, I'm taking, where I take that in my prayer life is um, I can do that today. I can choose to be at the cross instead of at the wedding feast at Cana or at the banquet. And because Jesus and Mary are suffering today, and that's what Fatima was all about, the, the, how the wound, the hearts of Jesus and Mary are wounded. That's what um, Margaret Mary Ella Cook heard from Jesus, how the hearts of Jesus and Mary are wounded by so much indifference and so much um, even hatred. And that we can, we can still be at the cross with Jesus and Mary today and be consoling them and comforting them and then praying for those, for those who do not know Jesus and Mary as we do and do not love them as we do, that they will be converted. And that's, that's um, consoling their hearts now. Beautiful. Yeah, the fact that he was carrying the cross and Mary and Magdalene and John were walking side by side with him. But you see other, the, the, the contrast, and this is, this is almost an Ignatian two standards. The other side of Calvary, you could see uh, Satan carrying a little baby um, with the hair on end, with kind of like a really devilish smile on his face, almost as if he's gloating 
over the fact that Jesus is suffering so much. But you know, when you, if you know there's someone there supporting you, praying for you, walking with you, you can carry the cross much better. And as you're saying, if the Blessed Mother were, I never thought about that, but that's, that's a good insight. If Mary were under the cross alone, that could have, maybe she could have done it because she was so strong. But how much but, more she would have suffered. Yes, but the fact that, that John and Magdalene, who are basically her two best friends too, must have, um, it's like if I ask, if I have to carry a load from here maybe to McDonald's of a sack of cement that's about 200 pounds, if I try to do it by myself, I probably wouldn't do it, but with this young man, young man uh, with his broad shoulders and his athletic prowess, that, that would make it much easier. If we had Derek to help us out also, yeah. it might even be better, right? Derek and Derek. <laughs> so a load shared is a load that's much lighter. What do you think, Eric? Come to me, all of you are weary, and I'll give you rest. Matthew 11, right? It is. And uh, it's also really, what I think of is probably two, uh, looking at it from two different perspectives. Um, in consoling the heart of Jesus, you know, a lot of times we think about in the agony in the garden. But there's another opportunity like Simon of Cyrene is to walk with him. We also do that contemplation, but to help, you know, carry his cross. Because does he help me carry my cross? He does. He does help me. I mean, he knows us so well and he knows that we have burdens and um, I read something once, uh, it was very beautiful about Jesus. Yes, he was God. He was, he had two natures. He had the human nature and divine nature, but he, um, he has divine, uh, you know, thoughts and aspirations or, you know, whatever the divine has, we, we don't know. But the human side of it, he has human sentiments as well. And I just think of Jesus if I'm suffering, how do, how do I think he's feeling about it? I mean, I think he's, I mean, he wants to help us carry our cross. And so does our, our Blessed Mother. She loves us so very much. Their, their sentiments are for us as well. So why can't we imitate them and give them our human sentiments to help console them as well? And I believe it really does. Like you said, Father, it... Uh, you know, we, we can console the, the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And it's a very amazing, it's very powerful that he's given us the ability to do that. Can I add to that? Yes, by all means, Mary. And we have talked in the forum, Father Ed and Eric, we have talked that, that we do console the hearts of Jesus and Mary through our adoration, through our prayers, through our praise, through our... Um, praying the rosary, are doing the Saturday, uh, holy, the first Saturday's devotions and the first Friday devotions. And so through our devotional prayer life, we do console them, you know, but we also console them by whatever you do to the least of these you do to me. For Mother Teresa, I, I'm, I, the thing that struck me most was when I read it, the per, the people that were dying in the street, all she looked at was the suffering Christ, and that's who she treated. Didn't matter who they were, what their, what their religious belief was, whether they were a good or bad person, nothing mattered but that this person was suffering, and she wanted to ease their suffering and ease their death, and she was doing that for Christ. And how much what we do to the least of these consoles the hearts of Jesus and Mary. We can never, that helps me because charity is how I move out of selfishness and pride. My antidote, my only antidote, my only safe route out of selfishness, pride, and egotism is, is, is serving others in need. That pulls me out of myself and that's the only antidote. That's the only antidote to that poison, you know? Mm -hmm. May I say one more thing? Really? Yes. We like this topic. So yes. Well, before we lose Keep this. expounding upon it, yeah. yes. The, um, 
developing well, a good one thing that freedom. came to me uh, was really amazing and we talk about the lives of the saints and how they they embrace suffering at a level that sometimes I can't really even imagine myself because it isn't something that uh, that I'm always comfortable with you don't when we have were, the grace yet. Yeah. we were reading from the um, the diary I think it was under number 57 and St. Faustina was expressing herself to Jesus about how much she wanted to suffer and that she didn't want anyone else to know that she's suffering. Even Jesus, she said that she didn't want even Jesus to know that she was suffering. Um, what a, you know, a great purity of intention uh, from her. That really su surprised me when I read that. And we read that um, in the um, right after our chaplet a, a day or two ago, but I thought that was very uh, beautiful and very powerful to that to what level the saints are willing to go that they have that grace and they accept it. Yeah. See, so um, I found another way, and we've talked about this a little bit, touched on it, but see if it resonates with you. To um, because honestly, I don't see the people Mother Teresa saw on the street, and I probably wouldn't know how to help them anyway. I'd probably hurt them more than I'd help them, okay? They'd probably die at my hands rather than be able to really give them any help. That's not from, I mean, I can't live Mother Teresa's life. But I've come to see the, the person that is wounded and, and bleeding are the person that are, that, we, that, that are the most least likable, people that are angry, that are hurtful, that are prejudiced, that are um, lashing out at everybody. I've come to see those people as very, very wounded and that that's the person I'm supposed to pray for. That's the person that, that is lacerated, their heart's lacerated, and I need to pray for them. I, I can usually only do it through prayer, but it's, it's been helpful because um, when I'm in a situation where I'm the victim of that or uh, suffer that at someone's hands, it's helped me look at them and say, okay, Lord, you, you're showing me, okay, Mary, that's the one I want you to pray for. I just identified him for you. It's very beautiful, and it gives my heart peace instead of me responding in kind. So we're, we're ascending Calvary now with our Lord, with our Blessed Mother, and with Magdalene. Um, Another thought that maybe really never really occurred to you, it occurred to me when you're when you're able to give like an hour talk in the morning, um, I usually give about a 10 minute homily, but my talks are an hour, I'm able to really expound upon it and then I think it through more, which is a, a blessing for me because I'm able to go plumb the depths of certain biblical passages that I've never really um, discovered their, their, uh, their wealth is The Blessed Mother saw Jesus crucified, but also the Magdalene. She was there. So she actually saw those nails going through his hands, the nails going through his feet, them lifting up the cross, his blood which was dripping from the cross. She saw that too. Of, you know, of all the people that really contemplate the Passion, she and John were the ones that probably saw it. No, definitely. They were the ones that saw it deepest. Even the other people that were watching, it was just, it was just like a, an amusement. They were just bystanders. But they were looking at it through the eyes of faith and love. Because you could have someone looking at something. There's no faith and love. It's just, a, it's just an event of a criminal being crucified. But if it's seen through the eyes of love and faith, it changes totally the perspective. Then, um, so she stood there for three hours underneath the cross with John and Mary. Now, um, often I quote Fulton Sheen. I think he's got some insights that are really profound. He says that the foot of the cross with John, Mary, and Magdalene, they represent three different virtues. And the Blessed Mother represents innocence. John represents the priesthood. And Magdalene represents penitence. 
Look at the contrast there. Mary Magdalene lived a very, very sinful life. And there that seemed to be the woman that's closest to the most innocent and never even committed the slightest venial sin, one of her best friends, probably one of Mary's, the Blessed Mother's best friends was Mary Magdalene, which I, th I find to be fascinating, no? What, uh, what polar opposites in, in many sense, no? But they were un after, after the conversion, they were very, very similar in the sense that they both had a, a burning love for Christ. You know, the first reading from Song of Songs today, it's a beautiful a reading. Song of Songs is that would be the uh, that would be the um, mystical romantic poetry of the Bible, mm -hmm. in which it's a short reading, but it says he's, she's looking for her beloved, and she's going down this street. Is it is there my beloved? And then another street. Then she asks someone, "Where's my beloved?" And then finally, finally, uh, the uh, she finds her beloved, and that's applied to Mary Magdalene. And the idea is that. In the feast day of St. Mary Magdalene, we want to be always searching for Christ, searching for his face, uh, loving him, but loving him all the more. So the Blessed Mother, innocence. She's a immaculate conception. John, I think that you'll like it, is priesthood. Because what is a priest? The definition of Fulton Sheen. Augustine calls the priest Alter Christus, the other Christ acting in persona Christi, acting in the person of Christ. But also, Fulton Sheen gives a definition of the priest as the, the victim who offers the victim. And then you got the Magdalene, penitence. And if you've ever, you know, ever contemplated classical art, uh, you have Mary, stop it, mater. I mean, stop it, mater, that's the Latin for she stood at the foot of the cross as a strong woman. John was next to her. The classical art of the crucifixion, usually Mary Magdalene is not standing, but she's actually kneeling at the foot of the cross. Her, she got disheveled hair. She's distraught. Tears are running down her cheeks. And uh, she's, she's not in control of her emotions. The Blessed Mother is. Not to say that the Blessed Mother is stoic, you know, but she has a, ter a perfect um, control of her whole being. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Mary Madeline makes it makes it so real, the reality, of the whole gamut of human emotions is that you have this woman that loved the Lord so much. Then you'll even look at um, her face and the face of the Blessed Mother and Mel, Mel Gibson. You see the blood-stained face because they put their hand to the cross where our Lord's feet were, were, were bleeding and they have the, the blood of Christ actually on their face. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great film. Mm -hmm. um, so Eric, um, once again, your, what would be your contemplative insight of, uh, of Fulton Sheen's comment of the Blessed Mother, Innocence, John, the Priesthood, Magdalene Pendant. I think that he really hit the hit the nail on that. Now she could have said other things about the Blessed Mother. He could have said maybe for it, but he said innocent, innocence. No, it's perfectly true. It's the truth. Yeah, she is innocent. Yes, perfectly innocent and immaculate. And think about that. Mary being the immaculate conception that she was always aligned with God's will, even at that moment. And she has another title, the Queen of Martyrs. Yes. And so she, that was her martyrdom as well. And if she could have, she would have. If she knew that it was God's will to be crucified next to her son, she would have done it. How could you explain this, though? You said, you said Queen of Martyr. Usually when you say martyr, you think about like Maria Goretti or Thomas More or Colby or you know the Cristados, you see, you know, they're being shot with arrows or maybe knifed like Mary Maria Goretti. How can you say that Mary is the queen of martyrs if she didn't really physically shed her blood? I think it's a good There's different kinds question. of martyrdom. And if we follow and we embrace 
the devotion to the seven sorrows of Mary, she has seven swords in her heart. Mm. And, you know, the, um, you know, that uh, there was the prophecy that she would be, uh, the sword would pierce her heart as well. But it wasn't a red martyrdom for her, but probably the worst type of martyrdom that a, a, a mother, the mother of God would have is to see uh, her son being crucified. Uh, to me, that would probably be worse than than being killed yourself. It would be worse because you're you're doing that. But also, the other thing that really strikes me is the intimacy of the moments that they spent with him, the hours they spent with him while he was dying. Because when people die, they have usually the ones in their lives, not always, but the ones that are very closest to them are the only ones that are there. And so, um, and it was also God's divine providence. But I also believe that Jesus, uh, you mentioned contemplation. I believe that Jesus wants all of us to be there at the foot of the cross with Mary and with St. John and with Mary Magdalene. He wants all of us to take our place at the foot of the cross and be among his closest family and friends. And we have the opportunity to do that through, um, through prayer and through contemplation. You know, Mary Magdalene, Mary, um, she was there during the Passion. She was there underneath the cross. But almost as if she's able to be there in the the totality of the Paschal mystery because she saw Christ buried, she knew where he was that holy that whole holy Saturday. But the the person that ran to the tomb, even before, even before the sunrise, was Mary Magdalene. And she arrives at the tomb. Um, hoping to anoint the body, and she sees the stone rolled back. And um, she's looking for Jesus, and all of a sudden she looks, and she sees a man that she thinks is the gardener. And she asks the gardener, maybe if he's taken the body of Jesus, tell him where it is so that she could take the body, you know? And when she's saying this to Jesus, he doesn't, he, she doesn't recognize him. He said, she, he said, he calls her by name. That's important. Being called by name is important. Calls her Mary, and then she says, Rabuni. That's the Hebrew for teacher. And then she's so enthusiastic, she wants to grab onto him. He says, don't touch me yet. And he'll tell the apostles that I'll meet them in Galilee. And then Mary Magdalene, if you read the Liturgy of the Hours, he, she's called the apostle to the apostles. Apostle means sent. She becomes the apostle to the apostles. In other words, she's so filled with joy. She experienced profound sorrow and she's filled with joy. She cannot contain this joy to herself. So she has to rush to the apostles and say, and the tomb is empty and the Lord Jesus is truly risen. So in Mary Magdalene, someone who experienced the totality of the very kernel and heart of our Catholic faith, which is the Paschal Mystery, the Passion, Death, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mary, what do you think? Good meditation? Beautiful meditation. And when we do in the exercises, it's yes. beautiful. I have, um, I have two thoughts, one on the resurrection. I, I want to go back to one thing Eric said, and um, that... We are, to, we are to share the cross of Christ, and that's why we, we contemplate it in, in the exercise. We contemplate being present with Mary, our Blessed Mother, and the Magdalene, and John, and at the foot of cross Christ, and suffer with him what he suffered, and to console him, uh, to console him. And, um, but also, um, I believe that every time we accept the crosses he gives us and we carry them, we are helping him carry his cross because he carried the cross to save our souls. And every time we accept a suffering that he permits, his permissive will, 
uh, whatever the suffering is, and we say, Lord, I know this is your permissive will. You're going to bring a greater good. I will carry this cross. Just help me. It's heavy. That we are offering that for the salvation of souls. We are at the foot of the cross. That if he could see our sins 2,000 years ago, raining down on him, and causing him to sweat blood in the garden, he can see us picking up our cross today and saying, I'm with you, carrying a cross with you to save souls. And that's why Mary was uh, considered, um, uh, she, the, a, a sword pierced her heart because she suffered, like you said, any parent's going to suffer, they'd 10,000 times rather be on the cross than see their child on that cross. And she suffered in, and was it Louis de Montfort that said the sword that pierced his, his heart pierced the heart of Mary? And in her suffering, so and she was suffering with him for souls. She stood. She suffered with him for souls. She accepted that cross. She accepted that mission, and she she participated in that. So why she's co-redemptrix, right? So, but we when we accept ours, we are min, min, tiny co-redemptrix with with Mary and with with Jesus, and He sees it then because He's God outside time, and there and it, so we become one Christ. When Christ loving himself. That's a favorite saying of Dom Boyland, uh, uh, a famous, um, I, th I, I forget, uh, he was a redemptorist, I think, but anyway, Dom Boyland, he's, he's one of the, the, the great writers, the spiritual writers of, of the church, and um, that's his favorite saying, is one Christ loving himself. The tremendous lover. This tremendous lover, one yeah. Christ loving himself, and that's Mary with the foot of the cross with Jesus. That's us. When we accept our cross, we are placing ourselves at the foot of the cross with him. And that's when time collapses, because with God, everything, there's one, God sees everything as one. He's outside time. So just those thoughts motivate me to want to um, accept my crosses and put myself at the foot of the cross. Um, what you said about, just what you said about Mary Magdalene is uh, the, the joy that she had. And, but her love was great. Her love was great. And her love was rewarded. Her love was rewarded. But we, we, we do is, you bring up in the exercises, the first one to see Jesus was his mother Mary. It's not in scripture, but we, we as Catholics, we know that he saw mother Mary. But the next, the first one he saw after that was Magdalene. And her love was great, and he was rewarding that great love. Yes. Yes. So in a certain sense, for us to plumb the depths of the Holy Week, as well as the Paschal Mystery of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I think we want to go to the heart of Mary. But I think we can also ask Mary Magdalene, maybe in prayer, we can ask Mary Magdalene for um, a deeper conversion in our lives, that we would seek the face of Christ on a, on a daily basis, that uh, our love would not become static but dynamic that we would um, be willing to make sacrifices because she got up early. We, sh we would also be willing to, um, after, we, after we have encountered that treasure, Gospel this coming Sunday is the Pearl of Infinite Price, after we've encountered that treasure, not to give that treasure to yourself, but to share the treasure with someone else, in a way, one of the, you know, one, one of the best ways to grow in your faith is to share it with someone else. You're not becoming impoverished. Right now we're sharing our faith yeah. with our live stream family. Actually, we're, by sharing our faith, we're actually growing in our faith, yeah. which is a real blessing. Because on a, on a physical level, if you give me something materially, I'm, you're more poor. But the more we, sh we share on the spiritual level, the more we are enriched and the more we're enriching others. So Mary Magdalene, I think, is a, is a, is a wonderful saint that can um, we'll ask her to pray for us in heaven, but also a wonderful saint. A lot, of the, a lot of the virtues that she had can be imitated. And not to forget that she was not born a saint. She went through her post, her pre-conversion period and then her post-conversion period. And as you said, reading that book, sometimes there's even... I'm glad you pointed that out, Eric, because I think we can become overly simplistic and think that once the conversion happens, everything is basically smooth sailing, it's a piece of cake, and even though, what's his name, um, Camille de Lelis, uh, I was reading on him, he went through a conversion, 
he had went went, went back to gambling again. It, just, it was just yeah. still in his system. There's one phrase of the Bible that's really strong. Well, a lot of them are, but a dog goes back to his vomit, and a sow, which would be a female pig, wallows in her mire. Eric, do you have any um, comments on on this topic? Yeah. I'm glad you brought the, that up because there was something that I um, wanted to, to mention earlier about another, uh, and a, for those of you that aren't don't know who Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich is, is she had very, she was a German mystic that had very detailed visions about the life of Christ. And her book, The Dolores Passion of the Lord, Jesus Christ was really heavily consulted uh, by Mel Gibson when he made the movie. Sacred Scripture was his first source. So I think she has some credibility, but she, um, there was something about what you were talking about, the dog returning to its vomit. It, it talked about when she fell back into sin after she originally had encountered Jesus and had an initial conversion. She went back to her old ways of living and she wasn't going to, you know, see him. And Martha was. They they characterized Martha and a number of other people that were close friends were. And there was one part of the book where um, Mary Magdalene had fallen away, and she was in a house. And there was, um, I think, Jesus was around in the area. Jesus walked by. She was inside this home, and she looked out the window and saw Jesus, and he turned, and he made eye contact with her. We talk about looking the gaze of, of Christ, and that's a great, to me, that, that's really a powerful uh, part of the book, where they had, they had eye contact, and it had a huge impact on her. Just that glance had a huge impact on St. Mary Magdalene. She was away and she was in sin and he, he, he obviously knew it. But it was a kind of a, you know, you can imagine the look of pain in his eyes when he looked at her. And then not long after that, Martha was trying to, she was trying to get her to come, come back. And Martha, her sister, was trying to get her to go and she invited Mary to go listen to this this talk that Jesus was going to give and so she eventually went and Jesus was talking about chastity and he was looking right at Mary Magdalene and she knew that he was talking to her and it just exploded the whole thing you know just came came down and it also said in the book that she spoke to Jesus. They had a private conversation, and that was a confession. She confessed her sins to Jesus. Can you imagine? It was such a beautiful, beautiful part of the book where she made a confession directly to our Lord. General <laughs> confession. <laughs> yes. So what you're really saying is this. Um, in our spiritual life, there are different levels of conversion. You can, you can go through a radical conversion like Mary, Magdalene, Augustine, even, even Ignatius or Camilla de Lelis. But um, the, conf the, the conversion, it has to keep go deep. It, it has to go deeper and deeper. Right. And if you don't keep um, developing that conversion, we can, like the dog, go back to our vomit. Right. And that was it for her. She was all in at that point. She was all in after that, that uh, episode. Mary, do you have um, comment? You have some comment on this, Mary? Just one quick comment. I know someone else who uh, had more than one reversion, but at the final conversion, they were all in, totally in love with Christ. And his name is Eric Files. Hmm. Well, you, you yeah, you, you mentioned that, yeah, that you went through various stages of conversion and then maybe 
maybe maybe slipped in the conversion and now I mean you're you're totally on board with your consecration of Mary your spiritual exercises you're not going to be skipping your holy hour your daily communion your your communion at your your forever but I mean you, you didn't arrive at where you are overnight no it took you know that it's very encouraging because I think we can be overly simplistic the, the conversion it's a it's a one-time deal where it's it's a life-term project I like the idea of work in progress mm -hmm. I feel that I'm certainly a work in progress, yes, and I think we all are. Here. Yes. Here. Working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So, wonderful conversation. So, um, I'd like to give my priestly blessing, and then in about uh, 90 seconds, we have about 90 seconds, it'll be the mercy hour, and we can pray uh, through the intercession of Mary Magdalene for all of us who fall in love with Christ. Keep seeking after Christ and go deeper and deeper in our conversion. Okay? The Lord be with all of you. And, and with, with your, your spirit. spirit. Through the intercession of St. Mary Magdalene and all, God, all God's angels and saints. May Almighty God bless all of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.